It's Friday, January 28th, and uh, every other Friday we get to talk with astrophysicist Paul Wallace about science. Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Thanks a lot, Doug. Good to see you, too. Uh, lots of lots of things to be talking about in uh, in science news, you know, uh, here today. But, but as we like to do, you know, we, we chit-chat a bit at the beginning and like to ask each other, like, how's the weather where you are? Freezing cold where I am, freezing cold there in South Bend, Indiana, yeah. where Dan is. How about those of you in Decatur, Georgia? Those of us in Decatur, Georgia, it's it's uh, maybe 38 right now, maybe. Oh. Hmm. It'll get up to close to 50 today, hmm. but tomorrow we're going to have, a for us, a real cold snap. The high is going to be about 31 tomorrow. Hmm. Mm. I know that. I know that seems uh, nice and toasty to you, it's like quaint. you might go, sun, yeah. like you might go sunbathing <laughs> or something. But for us, I mean, the low will be in the low twenties, maybe twenty, um, mm. something like that. But uh, down here, we get into the, like the single digits, maybe once a decade. Yeah, yeah. For and it shuts days. down the whole state. Yeah, yeah. It was, people don't go to school. It's like we don't want to do. We yeah, just, yeah. We just, <laughs> we just hoard fire and you know, I mean, firewood and uh, you know, milk and bread, and we just sort of. <laughs> I, I no longer have young children to contend with uh, that live in my house, but our neighbors obviously do. And when I, I was coming home this morning just after seven o'clock and they were, there were cars sitting out in front of my house uh, running. And I thought, I, what's, what's going on when I pulled up? Then I realized, oh, it's parents from our block who have driven their cars up to the bus stop so that the yeah. kids can sit in the, can sit in the cars. Yeah. They don't have to like, stand oh, outside. I remember, mm-hmm. I remember those days when you were like, it's seriously, you are sitting in this car, you're going to freeze your ears off. Like it was, a, it's a thing we worry well, about with her. At what point do they close the schools because it's too cold? I mean, has that happened? Yeah, they did that Wednesday for us. Really? Was, there wasn't really that much snow, but it was so cold for kids yeah. at the bus stop that yeah. they had to cancel. The one time I recall that, uh, uh, happening here may have happened one or two other times. It was thirty below. Right. <laughs> I experienced thirty below once in Georgia. Yeah. Did you know that? Because uh, I used to work uh, for Chick Fil A. It was my first job down here, and I and I unloaded fries and put them in the freezer. But our freezer was outside, so it was zero degrees outside. It was one of those weird times in Georgia when it was like one or two degrees outside. Yeah. But inside the freezer, it was negative 30. I remember thinking, <laughs> how can it be colder than zero? And I walked in the freezer and I was like, oh, that's what it feels like when it's I can't than imagine. Zero. <laughs> I can't imagine. I just... It's it's kind of spectacular, though. When you get those really cold days, they often are clear and no wind. It's sort of I think it's some of the conditions you have to have in place mm-hmm. for it to be mm-hmm. so, so cold. And everything like crystallizes, you know, yeah. it. The sound waves move differently. Uh, yeah, uh, and you can air. do the thing where you hold a like a mug of near boiling water and throw it into the air, and it just instantly freezes. instantly freezes. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, just, that's cool. pretty fun. It's, it's really great. Yeah, we we uh, I was cool. used to be a youth pastor, and we had a youth retreat on one of those weekends where it was thirty <laughs> below, and the camp that we were supposed to go to had to cancel because their propane tank froze because propane <laughs> freezes at like 28 degrees <laughs> below zero. So we found another camp on short notice for people. And we went and it was about 20 below on the Saturday when we were outside. And it was just one of the great days that I've had being outside. It's shocking to say it, but it was spectacular. We spent hours outside doing like snow Olympic stuff with kids. Yeah, and yeah it's 20 below. At 20 below. And, and again, you know, if you're covered up and the wind's not blowing and there's a little yeah. sunshine out and it's just crisp and clean. We used to have this game where we'd put kids on like an inner tube and then had a long rope around a circle and then people would run and kind of whip them in a circle. Yeah, yeah. Like you would do on a boat if you're skiing. Yeah, yeah. And man, on that snow that was so frozen, these kids were going so fast. <laughs> And, and I look back, I was in my 20s, you know, as a youth pastor, yeah. and I just think now, you know, if uh, as somebody who like runs an organization where we have like insurance, I'm like, what were we doing? That was. <laughs> <laughs> that we would was... do that too at, at a winter camp, and every year someone would break a limb because we. <laughs> We'd yeah. be whipping kids around <laughs> behind a snowmobile on these inner tubes, and they would just go flying. Yeah, and the funny—I mean, it was just—I I don't know—just the the nuttiest, the nuttiest thing. Yeah, the those, things those old days. youth groups 
do or used yes. to do. Yes, and, and, and youth leaders. And, and you know, as I, as I got older and I was like, we, there were people 40s and their 50s around that were like youth volunteers. Like <laughs> There are people that should have been responsible they, adults why did around. <laughs> why did they not stop this? I'm kind of glad they didn't because it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, well, hey, uh, if you're watching along on the on the stream, maybe you've got a story about your own winter weather or your uh, I don't know shenanigans shenanigans with youth pastors. Hey, oh, well, one one more story in that we used to go to Central America with uh, high school kids, and in 1989, we took nine high school kids, Shelley and I, into Guatemala in the middle of a civil in the middle of a civil war. <laughs> And flying back, one of the guys had a problem with his passport and he got stuck in the airport and I had to, you know, hang out with him for a whole nother day and overnight in this airport. And now I look back, I'm like, what on earth were we doing? Right. And, you know, we had parent meetings and people signing off on forms and everything and just, yeah. just taking kids. And uh, those there, there, there's a sense at which that. But, you know, this, I was at some I was at a really big church where they cared about all the things that you're supposed to care about. And they still say, right. yeah, oh, yeah, go go ahead. Take take a high school. Take basketball some children team. to a civil war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ah, was, the 80s. <laughs> oh, man, the good old days. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Paul, uh, we're going to talk yeah. a little bit of science. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, because it's coming up a lot in our in our current conversations about science and i'm expecting that you'll say hey this is just this has been baked into science for a long time so scientists know about this and know how to handle it because of covid uh there's been a resurgence in believe the scientists right it's almost almost a hashtag it probably is a twitter hashtag right believe the scientists surely surely it is especially because you know we had political leaders you know like the twice impeached uh, failed president trump that was um saying all kinds of things that felt the opposite of what the scientists were saying and they felt they were being shut down so there was a big political and cultural movement about believe the scientists so a lot of us sort of got into that and i see memes on social media that are like if you think something and scientists tell you something else you're you know rethink it because you're probably wrong there's something you know more more whimsical than that um however Scientists don't always agree with one another. In fact, that's the heartbeat of science, right? That's is right. that there's going to be. So how, how do people in public life that don't pay attention at the level that scientists do to these important issues, how do we make sense of disagreements within the scientific community? And we can talk about some specifics, both water on Mars or not, and yeah. the COVID vaccine and these things. We'll talk about yeah. those. But just generally, like, how do you, as somebody who teaches science, to college age people uh, how do you help them sort of make sense of this uh you the the main first thing that comes to mind uh, and i hadn't thought about this until just now as as far as your exact question goes is you've got to give up the idea of certainty got to give it up you got to start thinking in terms of probabilities that's 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 Mm. the that's the simplest answer okay um, cause that's all that we have. Certainty is just a, is just one of our fantasies that doesn't exist under any circumstances, even in mathematics. So mm. this dream of certainty, you've got to just abandon it for good. You're certain about that. No, I'm just kidding. Sort of those old, <laughs> one of those old philosophical. Oh, boy. oh, oh the <laughs> irony. Yeah. I can taste it. the yeah, irony yeah. in the air. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You got, you got to give up on it cause it's, it's not a real thing. It's just, it's sort of just a dream of ours. Um, yeah. So, so in the, in the public sphere, though, like on some issues, maybe it matters or doesn't matter um, if there was or currently is water on Mars. Science, scientists disagree with this. Back in, I don't know, the 1870s, 1880s, the best scientists in America, the American Science Scientists Association, didn't believe in germs. Right. Uh, you know, and then right. then later did when people in the Europe were saying germs are a real thing. They're like, don't wash your hands. That's just all that's all <laughs> nonsense. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter. And sometimes it really has great right. implication. Right. So if people are like, well, sir, I can't get to certainty, but I can get to probability. What's the difference between a extraordinarily high level of certainty like there are now now we say there are germs yeah 
Yeah, right. And right. and certainty. Aren't they functionally the same yeah, thing? Yeah, the, they're to functionally someone? the same thing. Uh, with, with with theories like that, I mean, the, the truth is it takes time. It takes okay. time. It takes a lot of time. It Here is incredibly go. difficult to know anything, to know anything with any sort of <laughs> satisfaction. <laughs> and that's what hurts my heart about people who are coming out as sort of anti-science is because they're all, you know, I saw a headline and I didn't research it because it was so painful that I didn't want to go any further. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? It's just like, I just don't even want to know about that. Apparently, apparently one of the state legislatures in my, in my own dear beloved state of Georgia um, proposed a law that basically said that nobody has to have any vaccinations for any school, anything at all, at all, at all, you know, and um, that kind of thing really hurts my feelings because that knowledge that we have was so difficult to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Work wow. so hard to get it, and now you're just taking. It's like taking and a so difficult and just, to just, get it. You know, in the public consciousness, to where schools would require vaccinations. Yeah, yeah. that's hard. It just fought. takes it. It just takes time. It just takes time to sort this stuff out. And this is like you said, Doug. This is how it's always been. But right now we just have this certain, you know, it's, a, it's in the public spotlight. It matters to everybody every day. And so this hmm. process, which has been going on for centuries, is now all of a sudden under the public microscope and people just can't believe that this is how you know, the science is so uncertain so often. Do you think, Paul, because the process is slow, like it takes months and hmm. years and scientific journals and peer reviews to come to some sort of high probability conclusion. Do you think the slow process is what causes confusion for the average person? Yeah, I think it, I think it does because I think, you know, right or wrong, I don't really blame people. I think that science is often taught as just a big pile of facts, you know, they're just yeah. kind of like just, they're just facts and that's what they are. You know, you, yeah, you're we dug them fact. up out of the earth and now we yeah, know. And, yeah. and you know, you, you get this fact versus opinion thing, right? Hmm. And, and you think science is just all facts, but it's not. It's not. Yeah, I, I like this idea, and it kind of helps me to think about in, in this current health crisis that we're in with COVID and the current round of vaccines, that if when you add time that we've known something and been thinking about it, paying attention and debating issues, plus the probability of what we believe to be accurate, those two things go together. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when, when even when I talk to my anti-vaxxing friends and you just say, but the polio vaccine, they're like, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you the polio <laughs> vaccine right now. Early on, people weren't saying that stuff in the 50s and 60s. But over time, it's sort of gotten to the point or germs, I guess, is a better mm -hmm. example. Yeah, we're now OK, we're, we're there on germs. Uh, we think germs are, are a real thing. You know, almost everybody would would agree with that. <laughs> In this COVID situation, one of the two pieces then of this like confidence we can have in science, one being a high level of probability of, of the tests saying that this has efficacy and is safe. The second piece of that that we don't have the privilege of, though, is time. Right. So to grant to people, yeah, look, we haven't been looking at this all that long. We don't have as long of a track record. Rather than uh, what what often happens, and I feel like people say who think that that uh, they, they want to advocate for for vaccines, and I think we should, and I think everybody should go get vaccinated, and really, you know, double check with your doctor if the doctor says no, um, that that it, that you should that you shouldn't get a vaccine. The people who don't want a vaccine are trying to say it feels really new and early, and then people like me who are advocating for the vaccine are like. Ah, don't worry about that. And I, what, what I hear you saying is, no, that's actually an important part of the scientific piece. It is. We it just is. acknowledge that and know that that's a piece that, yeah, we don't we don't have the benefit of that yet. Yeah, um, I, th I think, uh, you know, I have not done, you know, a whole lot of research into COVID vaccines. Um, essentially, well, it's two things. One is that they have, uh, as I understand it, uh, tested this vaccine extensively. And not only that, but by this point in history, we have 
well over 100 million people have taken it. Mm -hmm. And it has been almost a year. I mean, not, not a year, but what, 10 months? No, it's been almost a year now, right? That since we the first people have started taking the vaccine. And that's a big number. Yeah. 100 million is a big, what we call in value. And uh, there has been no indication. There are little, you know, certain certain circumstances here and there have been documented that, you know, it can create trouble. Um, but for the whole, it has been hugely successful, hugely yeah. successful. Right. And not only that, but that really is a matter. And this is gets really closer, I think, to the heart of the whole thing. Uh, it's a matter of who you trust. Who do you trust? Do you trust mm -hmm. this enormous society of people who have devoted literally their entire lives to this work? Or do you just or do you trust Joe Rogan? Yeah. So 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 what do you do when there's uh, OK, um, what do you do when there's an outlier um, the, on the screen here? We have a, a photo of Dr. Robert yeah. Malone. Uh, turns out he's somebody who worked on the MNR the mRNA vaccine um, mm -hmm. in its previous iterations, has a number of patents around this. Like he's he's in the club of the experts on this. Right. And has come out against this vaccine and thinks that it's rather uh, 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 dangerous and that, or, and that we've overplayed uh, coronavirus and all this stuff. So he's an outlier in yep. the rest of the community of which he has long been heralded as somebody who is worth listening to. Right. And this happens a lot in every industry. But what do you do in science yep. where somebody who was part of that community and is trusted and people think well of and, and has a distinguished career then starts talking differently than the rest of the no, of the uh, agreed upon knowledge? How should someone handle that, either in the scientific community or in the public? What do we do? Well, because he's on Joe yeah. Rogan's podcast, because Joe Rogan wants to say, not all scientists, you know, this this right. whole thing, right? right. There's all, well, you can yeah. always find somebody. What do you do uh, in cases well, like the, that? Uh, I don't know. I haven't listened to this guy closely. I don't know that much about his history. But what I do know is that this is this kind of thing happens all the time. For example, I mean, this is to be expected. I know personally people who have PhDs in astrophysics from Yale who are six day young earth creationists. Really? You can always find, always find somebody who's an outlier. If there were no outliers, I mean, it, it, it kind of like, it's kind of like this rule in statistics. It would be really weird if really weird things never happened. Hmm. Hmm. Weird things happen. You get outliers. There, there are, and I, again, I don't know this guy personally, but I do believe that general rule that you're, you're yeah. always going to find somebody, especially, and again, I don't know this guy personally, but especially when there's publicity and money involved. Then there's a little <laughs> more incentive I mean, to be an outlier. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this guy compared to literally thousands of people who spend their lives in little labs that nobody ever sees carefully working. And, and apparently he was one of them. Um, but I, you just got to weight the evidence. You got to look at the whole picture. Yeah. You really well, I, I, yeah. And look, and, and I think that's, uh, the most helpful way to think about it, which most of the time I think people do. Then you get in a moment where the pressures turned up like a health crisis, a global health crisis, your child might, you know, yeah. your, your, your mother might be more affected by this. And all of a sudden, Boy, people, we all don't like a whole lot of uh, probability stuff, right? It, it, it sort of reminds you of, an, you know, in politics when the social scientists come in and say, like, sure, we all said that Donald Trump had a 40 percent chance of winning the election. And uh, he did four out of 10 times. This just happened to be that's what 40 percent means. 40 yeah. percent doesn't mean zero. Everybody's like, no, 40 percent means you're not going to win. That, that's what that means. Everybody knows that 40 percent. Like you give yeah. me a 40 percent chance of anything. And it ain't yeah. happening, right? See, the world doesn't change just because you're stressed out. That's it doesn't point. change just because you're stressed out. It, it's the same old thing as it ever has been. And, you know, and clear thinking, rational thinking like democracy does not come easily. You know, it's kind of against our natural tendencies. Um, yeah, we got to work at it. And, and, yeah, and, I guess, work at it. and I guess knowing and figuring out all of this 
is is tough. I, let's let's throw up Matt Matt's question. Matt, thanks uh, for uh, putting up your question. Um, this comes from Facebook. Matt says, as a pastor, Paul, what are some resources you know of to help someone? I totally get over the hurdle of faith versus science. Uh, to initially, sorry, he's saying uh, he corrects this in the middle later. He says to initially get over the hurdle of faith versus science. I'm a pastor and feel like I'm hitting a brick wall when I talk to congregants. I think what Matt is saying is, as a pastor, he feels like the people he talks to make a distinction between faith and science. And I don't know if he's getting at you know people like Jesus is my vaccine kinds of people or or whatever it might be that they feel like, boy, faith and science are two different worlds. And now here you are, uh, a leading you know, uh, voice in both science and as a working pastor um, and an astrophysicist. What, what advice do you have for someone who's more the pastor side for, a con- for congregations like this? Well, I don't know if this, uh, Matt, I don't know if you've looked at, uh, the, the most obvious one to point to online is BioLogos. Um, it's probably the the best website available for uh, faith and science resources um, for those like you who see no essential conflict between the two. It's probably the, the it, 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 I'm not sure, I don't know you, so I don't know if it's your theological cup of tea or not. Um, it's not really exactly my theological cup of tea, but I, but I do know as a matter of fact that it helps many, 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 many people. Mm-hmm. biologos.org b i o l o g o s.org is a great place to look. Um, In fact, we we had the the current president of that on this podcast once we we talked with him so many people watched the live stream of podcast and I think that 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 organization was started by the person who's been the head of of NIH for the last Francis uh, Collins. Right. Yeah, Francis Collins, right. Yeah. Francis Collins, yeah. So it it really wants to bring that together. What uh Paul, you you also you know you work in a congregational setting and have to do congregational things. Um, any any advice on sort of how to approach this um, uh, issue of faith and science when someone says I- I'm just leery? Uh, I-, I I feel like if I go down the science route, that's going to take away my faith. Yeah, uh, I would I would say um, a couple of things. One. Well, one is that uh, the first thing I need to say about this is that it is primarily a pastoral question and not as like a scientific intellectual mm. question. I really, I really do believe that. Um, the second thing to say is that um, we are maybe ask the, the congregant um, what they think it means when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And mm. Jesus says, will you tell me? And the guy says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, uh, soul, strength, and mind. And ask the congregant, what does the congregant think it means to love God with your mind? Mm. Uh, because I, that's how I see my own scientific work. I see it uh, Great. right down the middle. It's, it's not, you know, there is such a thing as, as the sort of the scientific love of God. Hmm. To be, that's my own, that, my own answer to that question. And I think that uh, God does not want have any intention for us to uh, not use the uh, intelligence that we've been given. And you been also, uh, you know, uh, astrophysicist, professor, and pastor are also an author, and your own books uh, are helpful in this. That's front. right. You want, to, you, want, you want to pitch pitch any of those? Yeah, well? I've got a couple of books which you may find useful. Um, two in particular. One is called um, Love and Quasars, and it's basically. Okay. I had a student. I had a student uh, who found out that I was a pastor. I don't talk a whole lot about it, but students kind of they Google me and they figure it out. And this one student just stood in the hall and looked at me, and she said, "You're a pastor? How does that work?" You know, <laughs> and she you sort of see the question mark floating over her head. And Love and Quasars is my answer to that. It is as simply written as I possibly can. It's an answer to that question. Uh, the second book is more scripturally based. It's um, it's called Stars Beneath Us, and it takes a look at uh, science, the science faith question through the lens of the book of Job, which is uh, what a lot of people don't realize is a really, really mind-blowing view of creation in that book. Um, the so, book of Job. Book of Job, yeah. You know, yeah. good old Job. 
Yeah, it's wow. in there. The last few chapters, the longest, it's, it's God's longest speech in the whole Bible. It's the longest divine speech in the whole Bible. And it's all about the cosmos. It's all about creation. Hmm. Huh. It, it strikes me that both of those would be good books for like a book group at a, yeah. at a church or something, yeah. right? You know, like to get people uh, engaging in the, in those topics. You know, I think about Matt's question and it's such a, it's such a good one. I, I know that as somebody who I, I felt that some of my pastoring responsibilities when I worked you know, the, in the church community I was involved in for so long um, was to uh, help people not only ask and answer the question, what do you believe or form beliefs about you know, how, how you believe, but to also ask the question, what does your belief do for you? How does it function in your life? Mm -hmm. what, what's its role? Because often if you don't get at what the role or function of a belief is for you, what it's doing to you, for mm -hmm. you, with you, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the details of your beliefs, people can throw all kinds of things at you if you're like, look, th this is a real anchor point in my life. I kind of don't care what, what, what else you say. Like it, it affects me yeah. deeply. It's sort of the way that people, if they know about uh, this, this dieting plan called Noom, uh, uh, you know, you know, this thing Noom is it. designed, Noom is designed around a psychological approach to what does food do f in your body to you? And what's your relationship to food? In other words, it's not about the food. It's about how it functions in your life. Yeah, and so if you can, you, yeah. you can get at that, a lot of things open up. And I think for a lot of us as pa pastor, especially trying to help people sort of grow and expand. We don't always recognize the significant role that unhelpful and maybe even unhealthy or untrue beliefs mm. that people would even look at and say, I don't think this is all that helpful. I don't think it's all that healthy. I don't even know if it's true, but I believe it. <laughs> uh, it it's function in your life is something different than, you know, I, I weighed all the evidence and I made a, I made yeah, a sheet right. and put pros and, and and then I chose that's not how most of our nope. functions and beliefs uh, Absolutely uh, right. in, in, in interact with us. So, so I'd also say this as somebody who spent a lot of time fussing around in people's beliefs, um, <laughs> uh, be careful and, and recognize what you're doing, right? Mm. Because if you start shaking someone's uh, uh, confidence in this thing that really matters to them, uh, you you can have a lot of effects. So, and, and frankly, it doesn't work if you don't know what you're doing. There, there's a great old science book actually called The Web of Belief. I think it's a science book. Uh, who's the Who's the science guy that talks about the web of knowledge? Oh, wow. I'm way back into the early 2000s now. Um, a, way a on back. A philosopher of science, uh, the web of the web of well, web of belief. And anyway, the idea is that our, our beliefs are shaped and formed more like a web than they are like a yeah. building, like without, they don't really have a foundation. Yeah. And then you set something on top of the foundation and your foundational beliefs are most important. Then you lay other ones on top there. Uh, Quine, uh, Willard Van Omen Quine. Is that it? Yeah, it does sound about right. But boy, the web of the... belief, it's a, it's a book. Yeah. Does it, does it mention, does it, does it key off of a, of a science philosopher? Yeah, oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It does. It does. It does. That's it. Okay. I can't, I can't remember who that is, but anyway, but, but the, this idea that like we form beliefs in a, in a complex web that sort of hold us, it's just mm -hmm. a, it's a different image, right. Of, mm -hmm. of how we, how we organize our, our beliefs. So, so one has to be invited into somebody's web of belief exactly. to, to start to start to work in there. And, and that's what I meant when I said it's largely a pastoral question. This is a pastoral question first, yeah. And an intellectual sort of issue is a is a secondary thing to think about. Yeah, and and I'll also say, I mean, I th I'm sure this is true in science. We uh, it certainly is in faith and rest of life. What most of us use other people as a as a, a helpful and useful proxy. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have to know this, but I know someone who does, and I'm just going to trust yeah. them. Yeah, you know, and that, that's like, how. Yeah, there's not enough time to yeah. know everything and learn yeah. everything. <laughs> Do your ask, own research. <laughs> I can ask people research. how they how they know that the Earth goes around the sun. Somebody, you have no no evidence of your senses, <laughs> right. no no train of logic, great. no nothing in your world other than your third grade teacher and NASA, and people like me. Mm -hmm. 
do you just believe it because somebody told you and that's fine that's perfectly fine uh for it's not maybe you know maybe you shouldn't rely entirely on that kind of knowledge <laughs> but you know i think for to a large part that's just how it works which is why i believe that birds aren't real because <laughs> i <laughs> Because <laughs> someone told me that. And, Somebody I trust told me. Yeah. <laughs> because when I was on a mushroom trip one time, uh, <laughs> a big caterpillar me. spoke to me and said. <laughs> Yeah. And, and look, that's like, that, that's great. Right. And, and, and that, that kind of gets at this question. Some, someone you trust told you, mm -hmm. yeah. so you start messing around with that belief, right? Somebody comes and like, like, let's say it's the opposite of that. Somebody grew up in a family or a community where people who love them and cared for them and, and, and treated them well, and they feel bonded in heart and mind and spirit and genetics told them that the earth is flat and that, you know, the sun revolves around the earth. So they come kicking into life and they believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And then they run into somebody who says, no, now let's start actually look. And, and they start to wonder if that's true. And it's not that, simply one little disconnected fact in their head. It's, it's, in, it's embedded in this whole web of meaning and relationships and trust. Yeah. You, you mean my, so my dad, my mom are not trustworthy people to tell me something exactly. about this. And now all exactly. of a sudden you're into right. that. And there you find yourself into a whole other set of uh issues going on in your in your brain yeah and then so, it's you know, more I mean, like a house of cards and you topple yeah. one and yeah. what is real <laughs> you know what is real and so you know you get some pastor standing up in front and saying i'm gonna start messing in your web of belief and all of a sudden people are like i love my mom why are you saying this <laughs> what does this have to do with your mom you're like well my mom told me mm -hmm. and they don't even yeah. well, we don't even know none of us really know like wh why where you, that why do you hate my mom yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> why do you hate? but and this i think is what sits you know in a lot of our struggles relationally families uh churches our whole country as a whole we just have really different people that we trust and 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 believe in and um we and we're, and we're not all that actually we're not all that good at, at navigating all of this stuff you know no, we're not no. we're not we're not very good at that all right well you that's know, our I, that's our I, philosophical i will, start I will say this one last thing about that which is that, that that's one of the great benefits of of studying one subject very deeply it's like mm. you know I've, I've been able i've been fortunate enough to dig down into physics and astrophysics over the last 30 years and i can see just how it's all connected and how it's really real and how how it uh you know how it builds and out of charity, I, t I choose to believe the same thing about other fields, that m physics is not special and that it's grounded on something and observation and experiment and it's shown to be reliable. I, 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 I apply the same the belief to other scientific fields as well. The biology and medicine and so forth and so on are also equally, if not more complex and mm. more the deep just as deep and as grounded in observation and you know you know what i'm saying yeah. it's it's it i can trust those other fields because i've seen my own right that's a good point i i've, I've recently started playing uh the guitar like i'm three weeks in all and, right uh yeah yeah are, are you a guitar player uh i can i can play some chords and stuff i used to write songs and sing back in the oh, college, really? college really? years the college thing yeah, yeah. oh yeah well, do you, do you still have a guitar? You want to start a band? Um, uh, <laughs> Take a good, it on the road. Yeah. <laughs> start uh, a band. I, uh, so, so what I've what 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 I've realized in in playing the, the guitar, of which I'm I'm, I mean, I'm three weeks in, right? So yes, now I know I can move my finger to twelve different chords, but only four of them, five of them, can I remember and do you know without having to look at a little cheat sheet. But three weeks ago, I just, I knew zero. And now I can move, you know, I can do a C and a G and an A and an E and an E minor and a D and sometimes a D minor. I, like I can do all of those um, because I've just sort of, I, I've built up enough kind of just rehearsal only in a short period of time where those are starting to come fairly naturally. And I can mm -hmm. almost move my fingers, you know, into the, in, yeah. into the position. And then, so it becomes like a, a thing I don't look at every single time because I've developed just enough sort of capacity. And you look at the rest of one's life and you're like, you actually develop the, this instinctual, almost instantaneous response to things. That's what it feels like happens when someone studies something very deeply, right? Is that you, um, 
not only do you know a lot about it, you know how to think about it. You, right, you know, right, you, you, you right. know what I'm getting at? And so I can pick up a book on some part of physics I'm not familiar with and I can learn it really quickly because I know the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, you Whereas can some, you, you can play those chords, you know, of ideas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, Paul, I but love what you oh go ahead. No, no, Finish no, no, no. I was gonna say I love what you said about certainty and having to give that up because science really forces you to approach knowledge with humility because every day new discoveries are happening. Uh, Like we just, we just pulled up this, uh, this thing they discovered out in space, an unknown space object beaming out radio signals every 18 minutes. And scientists are like, yeah, this doesn't behave in ways that we are familiar with. We don't know what to call this. We're not sure what's going on. But that's the beauty of science is you you come upon something you don't understand and then right. you study it and you mm-hmm. understand it better. And occasionally, this might not be one of those cases, but occasionally you stumble across something which kind of throws your whole a whole mm-hmm. set of a, a whole larger set of understandings into question. Yeah. And that's that's when it gets tough. You right. know, uh, oftentimes we discover things that kind of fit in nicely to our to our system we've already got and don't really challenge us. But occasionally and this, like I said, I, I don't suspect this is one of them, but sometimes you come across something which really does cause you to question larger things. Mm-hmm. And yeah, humility I mean, is the word. Humility is a good word. I've been reading a bunch of history of science books like like popular history of science books, you know, the the, the brief history of nearly everything in these kinds of books. And boy, oh, that's a great they, book. Oh, God, that's a great book. So good. Uh, oh. I, in fact, I'm, I'm listening to it. I'm, I'm listening to it again. I've, I've read it before, but I've been, I've been listening to it. It's just mind bending to know how much personality and personal uh, animus has driven <laughs> so much of the scientific understanding that we have today. Like, you know, this headline, which Dan has on the screen here, experts say there's no previously known objects that create this type of energy. My guess is this whole, whatever these radio waves, radio signals are that are coming, there's going to be an entire drama around this where people won't speak to each other again, you know, because there'll be such (laughs) drama and disagreement. Like you want to say boy, science, you put on that white lab coat and you've taken off all the other colors, right? And you're just dealing with the data and you've got a, you know, some kind of a beaker in your hand and like, you're, <laughs> well, you find out that science is, oh my gosh. Made well, up of know. humans. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Made of humans and it is, you know, and it's just as messy and, and, and that's, you know, in this particular question about what that object is, is not being put on center stage in our, in our, in our culture unlike the questions around the vaccine and so forth. Right. Which, which, which involve the same amount of human drama and uncertainty and, and, and head butting, mm-hmm. you know, but in the case of the vaccine, everybody sees it happening and they're like, what's going on? Scientists mm-hmm. don't know what they're doing. It's like, welcome to, you know, they're just people. Yeah. And I was surprised. Real, real quirky, uh, personality disorders really quirky. You know, yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, wow. wow i was surprised speaking of certainty that in this article they say it's definitely not aliens quote unquote um that's a pretty uh certain statement yeah i'm, I'm not sure that yeah that's I, I, m- m- maybe this uh hurley walker person is just trying to keep the the the, the you know the the people calm <laughs> You know, yeah. so many, so many uh, conspiracy theories floating around. He's realizing what kind of a media culture he's speaking into, or she's speaking into. Right. He's like, nope, not aliens. It's nope. Don't even let your mind go there. Yeah. Like we know, <laughs> and, and the argument, I mean, the argument in this is really great. It says the team. So it says uh, it's definitely not aliens. Said Hurley Walker, one of the scientists. The team briefly considered this possibility, but ruled it out after determining that the signal, one of the brightest radio sources in the sky was detectable across a broad spectrum of frequencies, meaning that an immense amount of energy would have been required to produce it. So I guess on one level, it's saying, look, this is something that's, you know, that, that's coming from a force that is larger than any civilization, no civilization yeah. could produce this. The other is, way to look at it is, 
I don't know if aliens exist, but if they do, we know how much power they actually have to produce <laughs> yeah. radio waves. Yeah. And, 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 we should all assumptions. Be, and we should all be afraid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's just like like when they give the rationale around why it's not aliens yeah. is hilarious to me. Uh, Basically, it's what we call proof from incredulity. It's like we just can't believe it. <laughs> right. Therefore, huh. it must not be. It's just it'd be too too crazy to be too crazy that. To believe, so we can't believe it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I, I know we've talked about this before, Paul, but this seems like a good a good day to ask it. Uh, uh, do you think there's intelligent life uh, out there? And and I don't mean in another dimension. I mean in our yeah. dimension. Like, do you think there's? I, I think if I had to, you know, somebody had to had to put money on it, I would say there is, but we're never going to contact it. Mm -hmm. The distances are just too great. The distances mm -hmm. are are too great. Yeah, and, you know, probably between galaxies, you know, millions of light years. Yeah. But, you know, I could be wrong. But either way, you know, whether we're alone well, or not. you really hedge your bets on that one. I mean, that's kind of perfect, right? Like, yeah, sure there is, but we'll never actually know. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a perfect there, that's a perfect. Therefore, point. I will remain untouchable. Uh, but it, w whether we are or whether we're not, it's pretty weird either way, right? There's not, not like there's a non-weird <laughs> option, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Either way, yeah, no. it's really mind blowing whether we're alone or whether we're not. Well, and the thing that I've been just reflecting on recently, and I don't really know why, but just how amazing the Earth's situation is to allow not only life to exist, but a complexity of life. Yeah. Yeah. So different. You know, we're joking at the beginning about weather, but you, literally you're like from the Antarctic to the equator, like <laughs> the vast differences on this planet and that human beings yeah. with intelligence and an evolved sense of consciousness could also take place over, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years yeah. that, that it's. It's amazing. I, I heard this uh, NPR story about uh, what we think we know about why people experience thirst. And it yeah. has to do with, you know, chemicals that our body's releasing, having to do with the levels of salt that's in our bodies and just the sophistication that goes into one little system yeah. in the human yeah. body yeah. that makes sure that you're going to drink water so you don't yeah. <laughs> so you don't die is so complex and so integrated. And you just replicate that over all of the living creatures mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. these in this ecosystem. And so not, not only, only the ones that live now, but the ones who have lived over the last 500 million plus years. Yeah. I, I'm so, so you think, OK, maybe this is the one planet that's going to have intelligent life. Maybe there's others. But just zooming back onto this planet. Good golly. The, the level of sophistication yeah, of life mind blowing is it's it's really something you know um and and it does make one you know and while, while i don't sort of hold to the divine in sort of a you know a bearded person sitting up in the heavens somewhere sort of crafting things in in his or her own beaker of experiments yeah. i don't think that's how it all comes together it does really make you just ask yourself the question like how is nature so intelligent and smart and evolution so incredible here and it's not anywhere else like where yeah. did all of that intelligence and that like evolutionary drive for life where did that all come from do you, do you have yeah. any do you have any thoughts on that or no no this a whole other conversation that, um did i have the same sort of uh resp all for the whole thing um I mean the and, and going back a little step from there, the uh, the number, the list of requirements, as far as we know, for life to exist, even just plain old life, life, um, much less intelligent life, is so long. It doesn't just depend on the Earth being a certain distance from the Sun. It depends on what kind of star the Sun is. It depends on where the Sun is located in the galaxy. It depends on us having a large moon. Um, hmm. It depends hmm. on probably tectonic plate, uh, tectonic drift, you know, continental drift, te tectonic motion, uh, all kinds of things that we have, our magnetic field, mm -hmm. um, you know, just all kinds of stuff that is required. Say that, more about the moon. What, what role does the moon play in keep, the development the of life? It keeps the earth uh, in a stable rotation. Um, 
the rotation rate of the Earth is is stabilized, and actually, and actually, the uh, orientation of the Earth relative to the Sun, you know, the tilt, the twenty three and a half degree tilt you see mm-hmm. on all the globes, that is maintained by the presence of the Moon. It does uh-huh. change slowly over twenty six thousand years, sort of like a top processing. You know, we wow. spin a top and put it on the table. Does that, but the stability of the Earth's rotation. Uh, is due largely and to its tilt is due largely to our moon. And that uh, certain, almost certainly had an effect on the development of mm. life. And also without the moon, you wouldn't get the tides. And the tides, uh, we believe that uh, the tides had something to do with uh, life's approach to land, basically. Tidal pools and so forth wouldn't exist. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Without the moon. <laughs> The idea that the moon is responsible in part or in great part for the tilt of the earth is that's going to haunt me all weekend. I, I don't <laughs> well, that, even know how to yeah, think about not that. Not just the moon, but the but the, the weird thing about the earth and the moon is that the moon is very large relative to the earth. It's about a fourth the diameter. But if you compare that to the moons of other planets compared to their size, the earth's moon is enormous. It's a, it, it, it's really a, it's really an outlier. It's kind of a freak. So speaking of the moon... <laughs> Have you seen ads for this new movie where the moon is like going to crash into the earth? It's like an action awesome. movie. No. <laughs> no. It just seems like the dumbest premise. Yeah, but that, I don't, that seems pretty dumb. I'm not, and yeah. they've got to stop the moon somehow? I, I, yeah, right, right. I get it. Yeah. Uh, from a, the scientist in my head is thinking that's not even possible. <laughs> right. But obviously, I've got to turn that off when I walk in the movie theater. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, look, if 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 one were dealing with probabilities, as we've talked about, like science is going to help us uh, find a level of probability, and then over time we test those probabilities and come up with some level of confidence. The probability of intelligent life at the sophisticated level we have it on the Earth pretty low. Like pretty low. it's it seems it's, like okay, it happened once. Uh, it doesn't seem that that's a like if you just ran those numbers, okay, here's yeah. what we're going to need for there to be intelligent life on Earth that looks something like this, you know. So now we're going to have mutate mutations in birds and flus and yeah. vaccines and all the things that sort of make life happen. You'd probably say, yeah, that's that the, the probability of that is close to zero. Yeah. And but yet, even if yeah, even if it's close to zero, the vastness of the universe, you're bound to find another Goldilocks situation oh. or a million. Yeah, it's, it's really, a, a, again, back to statistics and probabilities, I mean, because a, that is true, but, you know, we can see 10 to the 22nd stars from where we sit. That's, you know, one with 22 zeros after. That's a lot of stars. That's um, a lot of stars. <laughs> how do they but, get to that number? Do they count that? How, how, how do they get, how do they get oh, there? Was that, is it yeah, just a math statistic. number? Yeah. Yeah. A, a math number? Yeah, it's a math number. Is that all that is? It's just, it's just a number that comes <laughs> One of those math, math numbers. I'm not sure I yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the the visible universe is so large in diameter. The visible universe, what we can see, yeah. is so large in diameter, and the density of galaxies is such and so. And there's so many stars per galaxy. You just, you know, it's an estimate. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of uh, the moon crashing, uh, our problem doesn't <laughs> seem to be that the moon's going to crash into the Earth. The problem seems that uh, Elon Musk is crashing <laughs> crap into the moon. Uh, e- Elon Musk. Great of transition. PayPal, <laughs> PayPal fame uh, shot a rocket uh, up in the air through SpaceX, which is, was kind of cool. I think I remember hearing about the Falcon 9. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and apparently they lost control of it, uh, you know, whipping around out there um, like a hubcap bouncing down the highway. And <laughs> it's going to crash into the moon. Uh, um, th- this feels like the first this canary in the gold mi- and coal mine kind of thing. That this is the first of what's going to be, you know, our children's and grandchildren's uh, nightmare scenario to be talking about. Which is, oh my gosh, we have to stop stuff from crashing into the moon. Do you know anything about this? Is is this is this a one off problem? Uh, I imagine it's a one off problem. I imagine. You don't think all that space junk is just going to all of a sudden start, I don't know. Well, Well, most of the space junk is in what we call low Earth orbit. It's nowhere near the moon. It's it's falling down. It's falling falling on the planet, on on us. Oh, Oh, we should be more concerned about that stuff. You know, now that you say that, I think I remember back in the 70s or 80s, people worrying about space junk falling. Wasn't that a thing? Oh, it happens. 
It most happens, of it burns up, right? Most of it is so small that it burns up. Yeah. Huh. Like large satellites, they often they often deorbit them and you know land them in you know the Indian Ocean or something. Uh, parts of them do you know of the large satellites, they're large enough to where parts of them might remain, but most of the space junk is small stuff and would burn up. Oh, okay. Make a nice make a nice shooting star for you, Doug. Well, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. If you saw so. But anyway, uh, Elon Musk is, you know, uh, crashing stuff into the moon. Well, which... I'm not surprised by that. But <laughs> Isn't one of his Teslas floating around in space? Like yeah. they literally launched a Tesla out there. It's somewhere near Mars orbit. I can't remember where it is, but it's pretty far <laughs> out there. I mean, I know he gets a lot of grief for that when they shot that Tesla up there and then had, you know, like a driver in it or whatever, but. I don't know. I guess there's part of me that thinks that was kind of great. <laughs> you know, they jump yeah, whatever you think about Musk, you know, per, you know, personally about the way he does business, I, I felt, I felt like that he had a guy's got a real knack for, uh, for market, for you know, marketing. Himself. Yeah, publicity. <laughs> yeah, publicity. That's the word I'm looking for. I mean that totally. that meeting that meeting where that moved from idea to concept to actualization was <laughs> had to be a great had to be a great meeting. Like, hey, so, wouldn't it be crazy? Let's do that. Yeah. We also make cars. What if we shot one of those as an ad for selling those cars? That's yeah. uh it's actually quite a quite a thing. All right, well, uh, our our final I think uh, touchstone and we should do this every couple of weeks is to see where the um where the Webb telescope is and how it's getting along. Apparently oh, yeah. it's find, found its little spot. Like they did it. They shot this sucker up there yeah, and unfolded there. it. A and million it. miles from Earth. Yep. I'm not sure if it's unfolded wow. yet, but it, is it? I, I, I wow. know that it's in its location, um, so-called uh, point called L2, but uh, it's, 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 it's arrived at its destination. I don't know if it's unfolded yet or not. That's yeah, good, not that I know point. of, but... Yeah, I, th I think it, we I think we're going to see headlines when it unfolds. That's a pretty big step. Mm -hmm. And it, it does it unfold like all in all in one like we start unfolding now or is it like it unfolds a little now and then moves in, it, has it been unfolding as it goes, do you know or is No, it... I, I imagine it'll happen over the course of a couple of days. Um I don't know that, but that's that would be my guess. It's a pretty big mirror. It's I don't know how many meters across, but it's it's a lot of it's a they're going to do it slowly. Yeah. Don't want to yeah, break just, it once they get it yeah. all the way out there. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> that, that, totally. It's, it's, it's really an engineering uh, triumph to think that, you know, it, I once asked an astronaut what it was like, a space shuttle astronaut, what it was like hmm. upon liftoff. And his name was Jay Apt. And he said, uh, it's kind of like driving a truck down railroad tracks, you know, like railroad ties. Hmm really violent shaking violently thinking, bumpy and, yeah. and, and, and here's this 10 billion dollar super touchy high-tech sensitive equipment you know riding a rocket like that how do they build it something that is so uh sensitive yeah. so delicate and, and make it not only with not only withstand that but to withstand that and still be fully operational down to mm -hmm. the you know to the nanometer you know what i mean i don't yeah it's i don't know i don't know how to do that but it's really amazing yeah, how do they do that? I I I spent uh, you know twelve minutes the other day in my kitchen. We have four kitchen stools, mm -hmm. and I had to turn them all upside down and tighten the screws on the bottom because they yeah, were all exactly. a little wobbly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, how do these things come loose? Like mm -hmm. honestly, uh, what what is going on that you know shakes the? And then you think yeah. they're sending this thing up there, and it's going to like e end up in decent shape by the end of it. By, by the I'm end sure of it all. I'm sure it's it's padded in all kinds of ways that love the shock, but I mean it's it's got to be pretty incredible. The whole wrap, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, the whole wrap, exactly. Yeah, it's it's I mean, Amazon well, in charge of it. Yeah, just remind people if you would what what this is going to do, uh, and 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 t tell us again what what we're going to see, you know, in this theory of yours about light waves. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's moving just, uh, away it's from us and at us at the same time. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick. Try it, explain that one again. The, it's basically the successor to um, Hubble. It's going to be a, a larger mirror, and large is good. The bigger the mirror, the, the more sensitive uh, it is. The the dimmer the light it can detect. Um, so basically, what 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 the average person needs to know, the non specialist needs to know, is that it's essentially just the Hubble. It's the next generation Hubble. Um, and it's going what to be. What did we learn from Hubble? 
oh, all kinds of stuff. We learned about um, the fact that the expansion of the universe is speeding up, not slowing down. We learned a whole lot about how stars are formed. We learned a whole lot about how solar systems are formed, how planets are formed. Uh, we learned a lot about everything, the solar system, okay. um, hmm. just everything. It just is, it's basically, um, it's been built and the, 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 it, it's a multi-purpose telescope. It's going to be I looking see. at the solar system. It's going to be looking at distant galaxies and everything in between. So in, in your in your world as an astrophysicist, you know, when you think between the time when you work at Chick-fil-A and uh, when you work for NASA in that period of time, was the is the Hubble talked about as like before Hubble knowledge and after Hubble knowledge? Like, yeah, was it that yeah Hubble was really. A, yeah, yeah. It's really it was really the first uh, real operational space telescope, uh, the one that really functioned. If, of course, at first it didn't function correctly. They had to go over there and fix it. Right. We're like, um, why are these images blurry? Yeah, yeah. And um, how, how did they go there and fix it with it with a, with a the space? space it's, in, it's in low Earth orbit, so the space shuttle could reach it. But the space shuttle can't reach L two, the point where right Web is not going to be able to be serviced. What if it? Which, what, what if it's blurry? What What, what if it doesn't? <laughs> be, that would no, that would suck. Be very that sad. would suck. Um, ten, okay, so that, that'd be you, ten. $10 billion dollars suck. <laughs> you know, put it on put it on Elon Musk's uh, fine for crashing things into the moon, make him yeah. pay it off every time. What what um what do you think the ramifications will be then going forward? Do you think we will talk about like knowledge before the Webb Telescope and after? Is is this yeah. also going to be one one of those? It's it's potentially the same kind of watershed kind game of, changer. You know, yeah, game it just yeah, yeah it's, it's really an order of magnitude more sensitive. It's not just, you know, twice as much or something like that. It's, it's a huge step forward. Wow. And you'd said that this has been, they've been working on this for a long time. In fact, they wanted to have this Decades. up up 10 years ago. Are yeah. they working on something else now? Is there a next Not generation? that I know of, but, but probably there is probably at this point, they're already, you know, back in the, uh, the, you know, the shady smoke filled rooms there <laughs> at, at NASA, they're uh, talking about the next one and, you know, purely speculative at this point, but they're thinking about what they could do to, to improve mm -hmm. again. Well, I sure hope so. You know, it, it seems like, like these huge investments, I know we talk about $10 billion being a lot, but not really like, like not on a global scale of all not that's compared to our be... federal budget. No, no. Right. Like that's, it's really, it's kind of uh, fascinating that 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 this that this can happen, but I'm guessing also you'll have to spend millions and millions of dollars to have scientists take in all this data, like oh, all yeah. of the all the things we're going to learn from this. Um, it's it's not like going out with a set of binoculars and anyone can just sort of look through them and see things and be like, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm looking at what the what the yeah. what telescope is seeing. All of this is data, right? That then has right. to be analyzed oh, and, and yeah, it's a huge and, process. And and people, you know, scientists from around the world will be accessing it. They they propose it's a competitive proposal process. You propose for time on it, and uh, most people don't get it. You know, ninety percent of people don't get it. And the ten percent who do get their get their data, and it takes time and money. It's not all American money, right? It's worldwide. Mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, this, in fact, this whole operation is not just NASA. It's 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 global. Yeah, hmm. European Space Agency, Canada, you know, Japan, everybody. Well, we we do have to go. I know, but uh, there's a lot of people who you know when rich guys send their stuff up in the sky, everybody says, "What a waste of money." It, uh, I, I'm uncomfortable with that kind of stuff because it feels like that just seeps over into also saying like, why do we shoot anything up there and why are we looking yeah. around? There's enough problems yeah. here on earth. Um, it's really good for, for life on earth and for humanity flourishing in general, isn't it? To do this and to so. look around and pay attention. I, and I think so. I, I think it's, it's, it's a very, it's as human as, you know, writing music or painting. It's yeah. just something that we do. It's something that we yeah. do. We explore, and um, and I and I do I do sympathize with some people who get you know get mad at the billionaires. I think that's a lot of just class resentment, which I completely understand. Yeah. But um, I do think that it's I do think that it's important, and I am a, I am inspired by it. Um, do Do your students uh, are they? tapped into this yet or uh, you know i mean i know you're teaching oh, the, college yeah, so students but i'm teaching college uh, i'm thinking about my physics major some of them very much are 
Um, some of them, you know, want to go and work at NASA and some of them will. We have several students who are at NASA now who have graduated and gone on to got PhDs, you know, and so forth. It's a long road, but uh, yeah, a number of them, you know, follow this stuff and want to be, yeah. you know, part of the next set of missions. I mean, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, there was and By such the way, they're, they're, they're all women. I'm, I'm teach, I teach all women here, so it's it's a, I feel really good about about that. Uh, th that would be great because back in the 60s and 70s, there was this whole astronaut boom thing that went on, you know, uh, just in culture. Like it was a big deal. And a lot of people thought about that and going to the moon and being an astronaut. Like being an astronaut was a, was a very desirable, desirable yeah. notion, you know. And it feels like a lot of that sort of drifted, drifted away. It would be great if there was a whole generation of people especially you know people that have not always felt like they're, they're part of science uh to, to to really feel like this is a, a burgeoning endeavor I, it's still there it's just not as prominent in the public mind but it's it's yeah. definitely still happening yeah people and that's, are and still that's, catching the bug yep yeah i know i wanted to be an astronaut when i was growing up Did you? Totally. oh yeah but but you know I, I and I guess you know the thing I worry about is the difference is that the, back then it was like I don't know Neil Armstrong got in a rocket and shot up and then stepped out <laughs> on the moon and hit a golf ball, right? It's like any I love that the the absolute simplicity anybody can get that it's like build yeah. a wall as far as yeah. the simplicity goes it's like oh right. I get it build a wall I get it go to yeah. the moon it's just like it's just so universally understandable mm. where this is whereas like now whereas now it's a little less you know, obvious. Yeah. Like, uh, make a proposal and then you'll download some data and then you can crunch yep. that data and then you can, you know, run some algorithms around the data. Now, that's crucially important. A hundred percent. It just doesn't have the human like pizzazz to it that, right. that other things, other things do. And it seems like we have to get somewhere into that world, right? Where there's something that feels not just like data, we but to, we, we need to discover alien life. We do that boom that, yeah. that's just as simple that everybody's going to be lit up now of course it's going to be chaos if we do that people down here they're crazy <laughs> enough boy well oh yeah well if we can fake the moon landing we can totally fake alien uh <laughs> alien true. discovery uh, come on it's gotta hey, be a hollywood set somewhere now now you're thinking Doug. <laughs> i yeah. love this comment from uh mark in the chat it's uh got an mm bent to it what is investing when done by a currency issuer it's the creation of currency for the purpose of hiring private and that's a great point like when the federal government invests in space exploration and stuff it can really just print money to do it and yeah. the only limit yeah. is is it going to cause inflation is it going to right so yeah we we can afford to do both we can afford to help the homeless here in the United States and explore space. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a matter of people, either or people think in binary ways too often. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they do. Well, uh, so do we. So you're either on or off around here and we've been on for an hour and now we have to be off. <laughs> because so. that's, not, that's all the time the internet allows us today is to be honest for one hour. Paul, <laughs> thank fun. you, my friend. You're welcome. Uh, ha happy bird watching. Uh, thank you. And, and, and at one of these times we'll just talk about birds. I, oh, right. I would love that. Let's do that in a couple of weeks. Dan doesn't believe in them. You like to look at them. <laughs> oh, good. I, got I can't mission. understand how they live in the winter and don't die. In all honesty, and if we could have a conversation about that, how a robin outside my window isn't dead by spring, uh, I don't <laughs> understand it. So uh, there, there, there we go. That'll be a topic for a, for a coming week because Paul is also an avid birder. That's true. All right. Uh, is that good for today? Anything else? That's great. I'm done. All right. Hey. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, I know we're on a little earlier today. Some of you are just now watching this saying, hey, I like to chat on the chat. How come we're on? Every other Friday, we're on at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Other times, we're on at 10 a.m. Eastern or 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, sometimes we're on at one in the afternoon like we were yesterday. So, you know, <laughs> good luck figuring out when we're doing this live stream. And we'll, uh, we'll see you all Monday. Bye.